It's a new day here at the MRS Fall Annual Meeting. Experts from across the globe are gathered here to present and discuss amazing discoveries in material science and engineering. Today, we're diving deep into the hottest research and breakthroughs you can find here at this fall's meeting. From sustainability to computing to 2D materials and more, we've got it all right here on MRS TV. Hi, I'm Katie Brace, your MRS TV host and guide through all the best of this fall's meetings. Over MRS's 50 years, countless researchers have presented game-changing and awe-inspiring advancements right here in Boston. Today's episode is all about celebrating the incredible progress we've made. We're sitting down with 2023 Fred Cavalli lecturer Alan Spuru Guzik to discuss his multidisciplinary work at the intersection of chemistry, machine learning, and quantum computing. Then we'll begin our daily spotlight on Symposium X speakers, starting with Takachi Taniguchi and his groundbreaking work in boron nitride crystals. And after that, we'll sit down with Mark Asta to learn more about his research in concentrated alloys. Plus, we'll continue our visits to top institutions in materials research. We'll start on the West Coast with UC Berkeley, then travel east to New Mexico to hear about the newest developments out of Sandia Labs. And we'll finish right here with Boston University. But first, we'll hear from a Sustainability by 2050 panelist. This recurring panel is always a feature of MRS meetings, but this time, it's also reflecting upon the life and legacy of George Crabtree. George Crabtree is a world-renowned material scientist and researcher who made major contributions in superconducting materials and battery materials. Uh, over the past uh, few decades, uh, George has made uh, many contributions in our society. Uh, the ones that uh, people are very familiar with uh, was that he was the director for the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, Jay Caesar, uh, at Argonne National Laboratory. Um, he led scientists uh, from all over the nation to make breakthrough researches in the energy storage materials, um, particularly battery materials. I was uh, recruited to Argonne National Laboratory and the University of Chicago in 2020. Um, and in 2021, I joined the institutions and uh, uh, my own research is uh, very well aligned with uh, material science and the research. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm a trained material scientist and an engineer in the area of energy storage materials, uh, battery particularly, and uh, my research focus on how we can use advanced characterization tools like electron microscopy, uh, synchrotron and the neutron scattering uh, to understand how materials can store energies and how materials can deliver energy in a more powerful and more reliable way. It's extremely important, for instance, if I ask around how many of you actually recycle your batteries, and I think a lot of people will be hesitating to say, you know, I'm very responsible in recycling all the batteries, particularly your laptop and the cell phone batteries that are made with lithium ion batteries. Uh, it's because the policy is not in place that uh, we have to recycle these materials uh, because these devices contains critical materials and they can be recycled and reused in the new devices. Uh, but because of the lack of policy, I think right now people are not incentivized to do so. So this is just one of the examples to show uh, the importance of policies. It is our responsibility to educate the policy makers that uh, uh, the traditional way of thinking about the waste is no longer true, particularly for those uh, waste that contains battery materials. They do contain important critical minerals and we need the help from the policy side to incentivize the recycling of these materials.
Today's cross-country visit to top centers and materials starts with UC Berkeley's RAIN Research Group. Let's see how they're developing the next generation of additive manufacturing processes. Additive manufacturing is a manufacturing approach that allows you to assemble materials into any geometric layout and topology you want. It offers the flexibility that conventional manufacturing or subtractive manufacturing doesn't have. My research is developing additive manufacturing technologies to create materials with three-dimensional architectures. And secondly, it offers the ability to place material across different lens scales. Thirdly, which is also extremely important, is that Additive offers the ability to, to assemble various classes of materials into a product. So it greatly simplifies how we manufacture materials without having to combine different processes and assembly approaches. I'm super excited about the future of research because we are offering a way to simplify how we fabricate, design, and use materials. Welcome back. Now joining us is Alan Spiru-Guzik. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. So your research is a unique intersection of chemistry, machine learning, and quantum computing. How do these fields interact in what you do in your work? All of those fields have something in common. They are technology drivers that are transforming society in the 21st century. Quantum computing is a huge uh, movement. Uh, several companies and several governments are investing a lot in those technologies. And my group was one of the pioneers that started thinking about how to simulate molecules and materials with it. Same with AI and automation. Uh, very early on, about 10 years ago, we started thinking about how to use AI for chemistry and about five years ago, how to use robotics for chemistry. We just found out there's 11 symposia on automation and material science just in the MRS. So I'm lucky to kind of start in the fields a little bit earlier than somebody else. And that's why those two disparate things are, are, are research done in my lab. So you touched on this a little bit, but how do you see AI elevating what we can accomplish in science at large? It's not only AI, but the combination of AI and automation. AI is kind of like the brain, but we are nothing without our hands, right? If you ask an AI, and this is something I took from Susan Gildert from Sanctuary, she says, ask an AI to make you a cup of tea. Let's see how well it does, mm -hmm. right? It, would, it takes a while to actually do all the planning and all the execution for actually making you a good cup of tea. All of that automation is crucial for us to do material science. Uh, so I think the key to accelerating materials discovery is a combination of AI and automation so that a lot of the tedious processes that we do and a lot of the experimentation is accelerated. Uh, and also we choose smarter experiments to do after we did the past batch of experiments. So do you think scientists should be cautious when it comes to AI or fully embrace it? Look, I mean, there's also some caution in the sense that you don't want to have an AI control your synthesizer and the synthesizer make poison without you building the appropriate guardrails. So in terms of care, you have to care about the guardrails. Some people are experimenting a lot with large language models and chemistry materials. They have to think about what will be the consequences of these models instructing the robot to make something that is not so for example, healthy or safe. So, but if you build a safety guard place and you are responsible, then you should fully embrace it because it's gonna help us uh, accelerate how we conduct science. And when we're talking about acceleration, it seems like quantum computing is just on the horizon. Is this going to be a game changer in scientific research? Yes. I have to say yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I a uh, big believer on that. That's why uh, this is the longest lasting research line in my research group. I started it when I was a postdoc and then I started as a professor at Harvard in 2006. Since then, I've been working on quantum computing for materials. It's almost going to be 20 years. Uh, quantum computing promises to be exponentially faster than classical computing and simulating materials and molecules. So once you have a, a, a quantum computer large enough, you will have exact simulation of molecules and materials. Game changer. So setting the future aside, what computational ideas and methods can scientists do to help their ideas right now, today. So this is the reason why my lab has always like three or four things going on, mm -hmm. right? I always think about what's 20 years from now, what's 10 years from now, and what's now. The things that we do right now is uh, enabling uh, these automated systems to do chemistry and material science in, an, uh, in a very smart way. 
So I'm lucky enough to be leading a very large uh, organization called the Acceleration Consortium at the University of Toronto that is helping us build these uh, self-driving laboratories at scale. Mm -hmm. So to accelerate material science and chemistry in a variety of applications. Right, fascinating. Thank you so much, Alan, for taking the time and talking with us. Thank you very much. Now, let's pick up our cross-country tour at Sandia Labs, where a chance conversation between a neuroscientist and a physicist led to coin flips, a potentially groundbreaking project in microelectronics. Coin flips stands for co-designed, improved neural foundations leveraging inherent physics stochasticity. What we're trying to do is take the noise that's inherent to devices and materials from thermal fluctuations from the environment and instead of trying to suppress it we're trying to figure out how we can have it interact and build systems using that noise. Uh, we have people from the materials and device side such as Shashank, we have people such as myself who are more on the algorithms and the theory side, we have people who are experts in computer architectures, we have people who are using artificial intelligence, the unique aspect of it is that you have co-located research and production. My entire career, I've found the most interesting, exciting, and impactful research happens at the boundaries of disciplines. And that's what we get to do at Sandia every day. And coin flips is an outstanding example of that. MRS offers discounted memberships for those working or studying in developing countries. These memberships are funded by the Materials Research Society Foundation. Visit the MRS website to learn more. MRS embraces diversity, equity, and inclusion by actively engaging our global membership, supporting the careers of underrepresented researchers, and investing in community actions to address bias and end inequities. In support of the DEI aspiration, in 2021, MRS launched six diversifying materials special interest groups. These members-only communities foster networking and community building around common interests. Find out more about these special interest groups by contacting MRS at MRS.org contact. Visit EngageMRS.org to find out how your organization can team with MRS to reach the material science community. Find out more about exhibit and sponsorship opportunities, our corporate partner program, webinar sponsorships, bulletin advertising, and more. MRS journals are growing in reach and impact. See the latest issues on display at the MRS Springer Nature Publications booth. Don't just read our journals, contribute to them. By submitting your work to an MRS journal, you'll reach a global and growing audience and have an impact that will extend for many years. MRS publishes cutting edge research, perspectives, and review articles along with books and textbooks. One of the hottest innovations in materials today is graphene, but this revolution wouldn't be possible without the 2D boron nitride crystals that Takashi Taniguchi grew and studied. Let's pop into his Symposium X lecture to find out more. Boron nitride crystal itself is so far very uh, commercially available and some industrially it's a mass production already done, but the, about the single crystal, uh, not such study is active. So the, my major interest is a uh, boron nitride has some polymorphism, low pressure, low, high, low density form, and the high density form. So the high density form, this is a high pressure uh, product that is a similar structure with diamond, so-called cubic boron nitride. That is my major concern. So the still the large high quality cubic BN is still the challenge. The question for the 2D material device is how to put on such a kind of very thin atomic layer. Because the substrate have some impurity or some other dangling bone, that is a, affects the, the quality of device performance of monolayer, atomic layer. So the, the people working in this field already know about HBN, that is a useful 
they are predicted because of the no dangling bond on the surface, atomically flat. So HBN should be desirable material. They knew that, but the, at that time, 2004 age, there are no available large, but relatively large HBN single crystal is not, not there in that stage. So the ours is the one alternative to use. So that our HBN crystal is one millimeter, not big enough, but it's still bigger for, as compared to commercial powder. So then uh, Colombia people start to use, then they made success with the stacking, HBN and graphene. This is a new uh, challenge, but they succeeded. It takes more than one year, but anyway, then they reported. So then after that, many uh, our collaborator use HBN as a substrate, and also some gate insulator and so on. So, so many applications is now launched. And just a simple crystal grower, material science field. So that I'm not a physicist. So I still am learning from some device performance and so on, but the, as for the, my position of the crystal grower, the, the quality of the crystal should be better or some other function should be there. But the, we cannot do by ourselves. So that the collaboration of some professional of device or some other characterization is it, face-to-face discussion and some up. That is a big benefit for us. That's why this opportunity I, I appreciate very much for MRS. Joining me now is Mark Asta. He is the David Turnbull Lecturer this year. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Thank you. So how does it feel to present to so many of your peers here at MRS? Well, first, let me say it's just a tremendous honor to receive the David Turnbull Lectureship, particularly so because the research of David Turnbull has really had a large influence over my own research for actually the past 25 years. It's a great opportunity to give this lecture to my uh, MRS peers, and uh, I have to be frank, it's also a little intimidating. You'll be speaking this evening about concentrated alloys. What can folks in the audience expect? Yeah, so I'll be speaking about um, the topic of local order in concentrated alloys. These are materials which are disordered on a larger scale. They, they lack translational periodicity, but um, they are a very important class of materials that includes so-called multi-component high entropy materials. And they've um, become a class of materials that have continued to yield new surprises in terms of properties and, and combinations of properties that um, we don't see in other materials. The topic of uh, local order in these materials is one that um, has been shown in some research to have a very profound effect on the properties. And there's still a lot of open questions about exactly how it forms and what its nature is. So I'll be speaking about that. And um, what I hope to convey to the audience is that this structure is really fascinating because it's often referred to as hidden order. It occurs on the nanometer scale, and it really um, is something that you can't detect easily through normal diffraction measurements. There's an interesting analogy with research that David Turnbull did, where he showed that, um, that uh, liquid, uh, liquid materials, which we usually think of as sort of featureless, disordered, have uh, embedded in them local structural order. So I'll be trying to make similar connections in my research for concentrated alloys. And you just touched on it a little bit, but what's on the horizon when you look forward at your own particular research? Yeah, so I mentioned that high entropy materials are something that has been investigated for over two decades, yet they still uh, continue to uh, present surprises, um, unexplained phenomena, and so there's a lot more work to do. My own research will really be motivated by applications of these materials for so-called extreme environment applications. And um, these alloys have been shown to present some really unique features that make them particularly interesting for these kinds of applications. And I have to say that progress in this field um, relies very strongly on uh, strong collaborations between experimentalists and modelers. And so enabling those kinds of, uh, of, those kinds of collaborations through new computational tools and way of analyzing experimental data will continue to be a push as well. All right, well, Mark Asta, thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you. Now, let's hit the last stop on our cross-country tour just around the corner at Boston University. Their Center for Multiscale and Translational Mechanobiology is unraveling the intricate relationship between mechanics and biology.
Magnet biology is a study of how mechanical forces affect living systems. Researchers are spread across many fields, from engineering to life sciences, physical sciences, medicine, and rehabilitation. So at BU, we create a hub to bring people together and accelerate progress. This hub is the center of multi-scale and translational magnet biology, or CMTM. Our center's mission is to serve as the leading nexus for research and education activities that integrate the study of microbiology across lengths and time scales. Any activities that develop clinically translatable approaches for enhancing quality of life. That's all for today's episode of MRS TV. We've been across the country and we've seen so much incredible science. If you want to look back at any of today's highlights or catch tomorrow's episode as soon as it's ready, you can keep watching MRS TV on screens around the Heinz and Sheraton, in your room at select hotels, on the MRS meeting website, and on YouTube and X, formerly known as Twitter. We're back again tomorrow. I'm Katie Brace, and I'll catch you then.